All right, Happy New Year, episode 20 here, uh, start of 2019. Uh, got a bunch of great episodes coming up. Looking forward to that. I uh, wanted to start off the year uh, with a good friend of mine, Mr. Paul Chapman. Most of you know him as by the name of Chappie, uh, one of Canada's best guitar players. Uh, he's a fantastic session player, live player, and he lives not too far away in Paris, Ontario, uh, about 15 minutes from me. And uh, I've known Chappie since the 90s, and uh, I've done lots of sessions with him, uh, some uh, live work as well. And I wanted to find out where Chappie got his start from, and we talked a lot about that. And I hope you enjoy this podcast with Paul Chapman. <laughs> Can't do three hours. I gotta go buy a fridge. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get this thing rolling. All right. All right. We're sitting here with Paul Chapman, known as the Great Chappie. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's like a painting. Yeah, yeah. The or Great Chappie, or a disappearing act. Yeah. Some kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you here. I think this is the first time you come here without a guitar. Yeah, I feel naked. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of weird. Yeah, so you're is. just walking in. And, and it's cold, too. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a lot different than it was a couple of days ago. Yeah. Good to have you here. We're at the studio and yeah. kind of hanging out. And uh, uh, it's going to be a fun year this year, I think. How's yeah. your year looking? Good? Yep, yeah, so far so good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Filling in nicely. So, Paul Chapman, we're, uh, I know everyone's probably very interested in finding out your backstory and where you, <laughs> where did this guy come from? <laughs> and uh, love, I think you are certainly a legendary uh, guitar player across Canada and and in the United States as well. But uh, um, are you always a fun guy to hang out with and always have a laugh? And <laughs> I know everyone enjoys it. And and uh, <laughs> so I think so. Anyways, yeah, I haven't been arrested for anything yet. So. No, <laughs> I've never seen you. Think about it. I've never seen you in a, in a bad mood. I'm sure it happens. Uh, but yeah, you could probably talk to my wife about that, and she'd have a, a yeah, <laughs> something to say about that. But, <laughs> but generally, you're you're like a pretty positive up guy all the time. Um, seems try like, to be, try yeah. to be. It's always, I mean, just try to have fun. You know, you take this stuff seriously when you're when you're playing, when you hit the stage, or when the red light comes on in a session or something. But you know, yeah, I mean, I think it's having you in on a session or in a band really certain, certainly lightens the load a lot. I mean, <laughs> cool. everyone having a good well, time. Thanks. Thanks. That's, so that's where, where were you born? I was born in Perry Sound originally. Yeah. Um, I don't remember there being there. I was really young. And um, my dad was always in radio. Well, he was OPP back then. Yeah. Uh, and then we moved to Toronto. Um, so I spent up to grade two in Toronto um, and my dad got into radio, into private radio for years before the CBC. So we moved around a lot. It was in Toronto up until grade two, um, North Bay for grade three, Aurelian grade four. And, um, and then my dad started with CBC radio up in Iqaluit. Um, so was he, what, what did he do? Was he a, uh, disc jockey? Or, um, or no, uh, a... news. News. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A reporter, journalist and, and read the news. Yeah. Um, then he started with CBC, um, around, s uh, 78 or so, somewhere around there. Yeah. And, uh, up in Iqaluit in Nunavut, it was Frobisher Bay back then. Yeah. And so I went to grade five up there and then back down to, to Sudbury, uh, ended up in Sudbury pretty much from grade six on. So that's basically my, I would probably call Sudbury home if more than anywhere else, cause I lived there for, from grade six on up to through high school until I left. Until I left in the moved to LA, and that's a lot of jumping around when you're yeah, young. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> it's it's good when you're young though, because you make friends easy when you're when you're that age. And yeah, um, yeah, you're not leaving. It's not anything jumping. serious behind yeah. or anything. Yeah, yeah. So Sudbury spent a lot of time there. When when did you start playing guitar? I started playing guitar. Actually, probably. Well, in Aurelia, in grade four is where I kind of started. My dad's kind of responsible for me doing what I do. He he was always a, a player. He played guitar for years. And then uh, we 
played a lot of bluegrass. He was a five string banjo player for years. So oh, yeah. that's how I kind of got started was he kind of showed me some, you know, G, C and D and A minor and the, 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 the easy, the country corner chords. And, and yeah. then I just spent the first while just kind of sitting in the bedroom at home and strumming guitar behind him playing banjo. That's pretty much how, how it kind of started. Um, Went to a lot of bluegrass festivals growing up. Did a lot of that yeah. kind of jamming by the campfire till five a.m. kind of thing, and played in some bands with him back then, and and uh, started playing electric guitar. Not, I started playing in general when I was about ten. Yeah, uh, playing acoustic and stuff. Um, phased into electric maybe a couple of years after that. Got my first electric guitar from. It used to be Music City in North Bay. Oh, yeah. It was a Telecaster copy, a Lero Tele copy that my, my dad got from me back then. You still have it? No, no, no. no. I'm trying to remember what happened. I don't. They, we probably just sold it, turned it back. And after that, it was a, it was a Burgundy L. Degas Les Paul knockoff. After that, and then the PV, the original PV T60. Oh yeah, big like 100 pound ash body electric they had the t40 bass and the t60 guitar that came out back way yeah. back then um so yeah i spent <clears throat> doing a lot of that just kind of always played bluegrass and mandolin kind of around the same time and then picked up electric when i was probably around 12 or 13 and spending just a lot of time in my bedroom dropping the needle on different spots of records and trying to lift licks and trying to learn stuff you know so pretty well kind of self-taught did you yeah have, pretty much yeah. my dad showed me how to get got going but after that it was pretty much just lots of time in my bedroom when i was a when i was a kid before school and at lunch and after school and just yeah. playing along to they used to sit and there was we were always looking for players i'm a james burton fan and albert lee guy you know frank ricard guys like that it was certain players i was always looking for so we found out they were on certain songs i would always sit around with the with a tape deck, the old tape decks at home with, with record and play on pause ready. And whenever I heard a song on the radio I wanted, I'd hit pause and you'd always miss the beginning. Cause, yeah, yeah. But end up with cassettes full of tunes off the radio with players that I wanted to hear and, you know, just learn and stuff like that. And it's I talked before about it, but back in the day when I, I, I learned very much the same way on record players, right? Yep. And what a pain in the neck that was trying yeah. to drop the needle especially if you once you got the first few bars down yeah and you wanted to listen to something and maybe about eight yeah. bars in <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> you always have to go back to the beginning or try to drop it right in the right spot in the right and, spot i know and listen and pick it back up again yep. and put it back down and and you think now how easy it is to just kind of if you can slow things down you can oh i know, you know it's crazy um, slow things down without the tempo change or without the the pitch changing yeah. either you used to be able to get tape decks back in the day that had a a, a, like a speed shift on it would yeah. slow it down but it would mess up the pitch and try to figure something out in the wrong key <laughs> I know. and the guitar player magazine came up with those tear out plastic records oh, in the yeah, middle of them yeah I forgot about those remember yeah. those yeah yeah and you'd have to put them on a regular album and put some pennies on it to weigh yeah, it yeah, down, weigh it down yeah. <laughs> man I totally forgot about that yeah there's a lot of stuff that came out in those things all that they had tab with them yeah I spent learned a lot of stuff off of those things Wow, gee, that just brought back. I know, a bunch of I know, I know. <laughs> so yeah. I did a lot of playing like that, and around Sudbury, and then uh, my dad used to take me out to. <clears throat> there was a lot of, you know, people would come through town. Ray Materic and different people would come through town, and often my my dad would drag me down to wherever they were playing, and he, I was obviously not old enough to get in, yeah. but he would kind of schmooze the bouncer at the front door and oh just can we just stand inside the door and listen we just want to hear the band kind of thing so he yeah. did that a lot and he used to take me out we used to go the park and the national tavern in Sudbury used to have uh well they to, to my knowledge well the park's not there anymore but those used to be like six night a week gigs and they have matinees on every saturday afternoon and yeah so i i was fortunate that by the time i was 15 i was as tall as i am so yeah I, it was easier to get in, so my dad would drag me down to some matinees and get up and jam with some of the bands. And I got up and jammed with a with a guy. It was a Charles Simon is his name. He's down in Niagara Falls right now, but he had a band back in several years ago called Charles Simon and Solitaire. And that's the first band I ever played with. My I went to a matinee at the Nash on a Saturday afternoon and got up and jammed with them and 
so Charles, I did a few too, some Ricky's gang tunes and all the yeah. stuff that was big back then. And, and, uh, so on the break, Charles came out and said, Hey, where are our guitar players leaving in a couple of weeks? If you want to come play with our band and, and uh, that was it. That was the beginning of the, of 30, 30 years, 35 years later. Yeah. That was the beginning of it all. The very first gig I ever did was at the Algoma Tavern in Chelmsford. Wow. Outside of Sudbury, Friday and Saturday night there. So I, I do thought, you remember that pretty vividly? Or oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I remember going, hmm, wow, I'm 15. This is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be. I mean. I've been um, playing ever since. That's, uh, and probably back then with the amount of playing that was going on. Uh, you know, six nights a week and matinees and stuff. That was probably, I tried to recount this a little while back. There was at least five clubs in Sudbury at the time that were six, six, six nights a week gigs that you could play yeah. all the time. The Kingsway was six nights downstairs, and then Sunday you'd move all your PA and everything up, up upstairs, up the fire escape, and play Sunday afternoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a that's all gone. There's, I don't even know if there's anything around anymore. That's a six night a week gig. Yeah, unless you're in like Vegas or something. Yeah, well, I even did, then, I did a lot of that stuff too. Yeah, at Reno and Vegas, and those are six nights a week. You know, playing four one hour sets a night. Yeah, or four forty five minute sets a night. You know, every night. You know, it's a good for you play. <laughs> That's a lot of playing. Oh, I know. So, you know, you were doing that. You, you got your first band, and how long did you? How long did you play with them? Do you remember? Um, probably. I don't know, maybe two or three years or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then did some playing with other bands around town, you know, subbing in and this and that. Um, and then eventually ended up with a bunch of guys um, in a band called Rumors. And that was a, we were steady working every week with that band for probably three or four years with that band too till I, till I left. Yeah. So as far as school goes and that, um, did you do anything once you finished up high school or did you just stick, just nope. stick with music? Yeah. yeah, I graduated high school and some grade 13 credits back at, in the day. They don't have grade 13 anymore. But yeah. but no, I was, uh, it was hard the last year or so because I was playing so much, playing six nights a week and doing my homework on the breaks and the bars and stuff like that until oh, yeah. one o'clock and getting up and going to school. And, and uh, but no, that was it. After that, I was just playing. School of Hard Knocks. After that, so did you have? Did you have any other aspirations that you you know thought you might want to do besides music when you were in school, or is it just or was it always just music was kind of consumed what you were doing? Oh uh, well, when Raiders of the Lost came out, came out, I was going to be an archaeologist. Oh yeah, yeah, that was it. I was, I was going to. I wanted to go to university and study anthropology and 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 stuff like that for a while, and and uh, it uh, never happened. No. <laughs> I can see that. I ended up playing digging up bones instead. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> as close as I ever got to archaeology was playing digging up bones. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so, finishing up high school, um, start. You know, you're obviously playing a lot. Um, and what did you feel? What was your kind of big break after you you're playing with this group called Rumors, right? Yeah, yeah, just playing around Sudbury and stuff. And I finished high school. I was doing that stuff. But I just wanted wanted to play more. I wanted to get out of Sudbury. And nothing wrong with Sudbury. It's a great town. It's a very artsy town. Lots of music and stuff yeah. going on there. But I just wanted to do more. I wanted to get out. And so I... Uh, I, 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 took a, I took two driving tests with a guy up there. Um did my road test and pass and got my license and then moved to LA. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically I just wanted to get out. So I packed a packed up a telecaster and a bag of underwear and <laughs> moved to yeah. LA and bought a map and a car and and uh there's another guitar player from Sudbury who's been in LA for years named Al Banam. So I got a hold of him and uh he kinda, you know, gave me some numbers of guys and told me where to go as far as the bars to go you know, where to go sit in and jam and stuff like that. And, yeah. And pretty much, yeah, I just kind of waltzed down there blind and bought a car and a map of a Thomas Guide book of map book of L.A. and found out where the country bars were and just kind of went in and introduced myself and jammed and stuff like that. And it was great. That was a great experience. I was there for four years and uh, playing I, all the time and everybody was great about it. They were, yeah. they were no, 
weird attitudes or nothing. Everybody was great. They were, come on and play. Uh, and end up working six nights a week there too. But it was a different, it's like a different place almost every night. You oh, might yeah. you might play a Friday, Saturday at one bar. But then you can play every other night of the week at a different place. Yeah. Every bar had a had a country night on one night of the week or something, you know. So what made you decide L.A.? Why not Nashville or... Yeah, I've been asked that before because I Mm -hmm. wasn't sure if I just wanted to play country because I was playing a lot of rock stuff too back in the 80s rock stuff, you know, the Yngwie Malmsteen and Joe Satriani kind of thing and all the the guitar god rock stuff that was going on and I was really into playing a lot of that too so I wasn't sure exactly when I knew there was a country scene in L.A., but there was everything else, and I just, that's pretty much what it was. I just, I didn't know if I just wanted to play country. Yeah. So, do you remember kind of getting on the plane and heading there? Yep. I mean, that's, that's a pretty ballsy move to just kind of <laughs> jump from Sudbury to <laughs> I LA. Know. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, I had a friend of mine, Tom Fife, a blues uh, guitar player, singer from Sudbury, drove me to the airport in Toronto. And uh, I bought, I remember I bought a, I saved up. I think I saved up like two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars or something to buy a car, yeah. And I booked a return ticket that was good for three months. Oh yeah, I remember that. So I knew I had at least three months to figure it out and see if it was going to work, and or if it didn't, I I had my return ticket home. Yeah. But uh, no, I remember I got down there and I was, we have some some friends of the of the family that we knew, older couple that lived in in Bellflower. Um, in the southern part of LA, I stayed with them for a couple of weeks. Yeah, and uh, uh, bought a little car. Was driving around, and then I ended up uh, not far from their house, like a mile away. I ended up hooking up with Dale Watson. Um, he had a house gig at a bar called the Blue Bayou down in in, in Lakewood or Bellflower. I think it was Bellflower. But anyways, and Dale had a, like a house gig there, five nights a week, like Wednesday to saturday uh gig at at the blue bayou and he had basically him and jim leslie and and john lee white was his basic rhythm section but then he hired a different fourth piece yeah every night almost so i would just go sit in with them every night and i met most of the players in la over like a three-week period just sitting in with them because all, right. all the the rotating fourth piece he'd have it might be a guitar player or might have been, you know, Skip Edwards playing piano or J.D. Main is playing steel or something. But yeah. I ended up meeting like all kinds of players really fast. I used to just go jam every night just to sit in. And yeah. Dale was really cool. He used to pay me out of the tip jar and give me all a right. few bucks every night just for coming and hanging out. But yeah, well, that was a great, great thing there. And uh, so when did you when did you get your first real paying gig in, in L.A.? The, oh, the first gig I ever got was, it's a funny, I went to the NAMM show while I was down there because I moved down there in the beginning of January and I went to the NAMM show. Um, oh yeah, this was back in 90, I think, 89 or 90. And the NAMM show was still relatively small. It was still just in the Anaheim Convention Center. It hadn't spread out to all the other yeah. places that it is now. And I was in there walking around and I, I, I've, uh, I was at the Fender booth and I was noodling around. I met James Burton there. I've got a great picture of me and James Burton and Albert Lee and Jerry Donahue. I was hanging out at the Fender booth. Yeah. And uh, so I was messing around James Burton's Paisley guitars, the tellies that come out um, with the lace sensor pickups and all that kind of stuff. So I was noodling around and one of those Jerry Donahue was there. So we kind of started jamming a little bit, picking together at the Fender booth at the NAMM show. And he was like, what are you doing next Wednesday? I'm going, well, nothing. I just got to town. I'm looking for work. So so he go, well, I got a showcase at the Palomino with this guy named Charlie Mitchell. If you're, I can't do it. So I need a sub if you're interested. So wow. That ended up being my first gig, paying gig in LA was subbing for Jerry Donahue from the Helicasters at the Palomino. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that was kind of thing. And But that's another great place too is hanging out there. The Palomino was, there was a Ronnie Max barn dance on uh, Tuesday nights and the Monday night talent night thing with a stellar band of those guys were fantastic. And there was a great place to just go hang out and meet people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's certainly when you think about it and it always comes back to the music industries, you know, you got to have your skills, but it's more who, you know, um, and your opportunities that get put in front of you. And some of them are by chance. Some of them are by luck, but some of them are just because, 
you know, you made it happen. Um, uh, but it's neat. You know, you think if you weren't, uh, at the NAM booth at that time, yeah. you know, would you, you know, it's, it's funny how those, those little things, those that, little things, yep. that change. And that's the stuff you're only going to comp. You're going to, going to find in places like that in places like that. Yeah. And now that's where those people are. Yeah. You know, like I say, there's nothing wrong with growing up from being from Sudbury. But I'm not going to go, there's no NAM show, and I'm not going to run into Jerry Donahue at the NAM show in Sudbury. No. You know what I mean? And you're not, you don't have the places like LA and New York and Nashville, something like that. You can just go see these people play. Yeah. You can go to the Baked Potato in LA and see Steve Lukather and Larry Carlton and just go see them play. You know, you, I used to play a little wine bar in, out in Calabasas. Um, sub, like it was. Albert Lee used to do it all the time, and whenever he was on the road with the Everly Brothers, they'd call me, oh, yeah. and I'd sub for him at this little wine bar. It didn't pay much, yeah, but it was always a great Archie Francis and all these old great country players from from back back then, from the seventies and eighties, were all hanging out there picking and jamming, having a great time. So you meet a lot of people really fast. Yeah, and you know it's funny, the guys who are really good, I find, are people who just can't stop playing. Right. Yeah. I, I find the best players are always playing steady, whether they're at home. Yeah. And they're not, you know, necessarily always in front of the TV or just taking a week off. They're always playing. Yeah. And it's just something that's inherent in them that just they want to just keep keep going. Yeah. I try to leave them lying around and and just go down to the basement and. Yeah. Just, when you get you know, and as you as you you get decent instruments and stuff like that and. And he just inspires you to want to pick it up and start noodling around and just keep playing. And yeah, so being in LA, what else? What else did you do when you were in LA? Oh, a lot of playing, like I say, it was pretty much every night. And they started to get doing a lot of session work for Jerry Fuller. Jerry had a, a studio called Footprint. Jerry wrote uh, all kinds of hit songs for old, like all the Ricky Nelson stuff. Like he wrote uh, "Traveling Man" and oh, yeah. and he produced all the Gary Puckett and Union Gap stuff. And so I was kind of. I had met him through uh, somebody like through John Hobbs and Steve Duncan and and uh, J D Manus, like I guess from the Desert Rose Band and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And, and um, so I just found myself doing a lot of I was kind of Jerry's kind of house studio guy for doing demos and sessions and stuff, and and that was really good too. We did a lot of really great stuff there. Working with him, he was a oh. super great guy and a and a legend, a legendary songwriter and producer. So it was really cool to work with him. Yeah. So being in LA for four years, what what kind of made you make the decision to to come back? Well, I was in Reno after that. Mm -hmm. I ended up playing with a guy out of LA named Eddie Dunbar, um, who Jerry Fuller produced um, some stuff with Eddie. Eddie was playing with a local band, um, and Eddie's a phenomenal singer, bass player, like stellar, just a major talent. Um, he's in Nashville now. I haven't uh, talked to him uh, over Facebook every once in a while. But um, so they were trying to groom Eddie for a record deal. They were Jerry, Jerry and a, and a manager named Bob D had got Colin Ray going. Oh yeah. So they were trying to groom Eddie to do the same kind of thing. So we did the album. Um, Bob Bob Montgomery and Jerry Fuller produced the album. They did half in some of it in L.A. and some of it in Nashville. And um, so to get Eddie out on the scene, his manager Bob D was based out of Reno. Mm -hmm. and so we subsequently just they put Eddie to work and sent him on the road and so we ended up doing a lot of casino stuff in Vegas and in Reno and lots in Reno so the the drummer and I Mike called him and we just ended up moving to Reno oh, yeah. because a lot of the we were got really busy doing the, the casino stuff so we did that for a good couple of years and James Stroud came out saw a showcase and signed Eddie to Giant Records and then that's how we ended up doing the album and wow yeah, and there was lots lots of music in Vegas and Reno yeah. at that time. Yeah, oh yeah, you'd play all, they were, every casino had two bands, an early shift and a late shift. And if you were, most times, typically you'd be at a casino for like two weeks. Yeah. And the first week you'd do the late shift or the early shift, and then the second week you'd do the opposite one. Yeah. And you'd always, it would always be a country band and like a funk band or an R&B band. Yeah. Or, um, or some other, there'd never be two country bands. It was yeah. always a country band and some other kind of actor, a magician or something, or, or a hypnotist or something or whatever. Yeah. So you get to meet a lot of guys. And then after we done, we'd go out around to the other casinos and watch other bands. And 
It was really cool with that. A lot of camaraderie, all the players. Everybody knew each other. Yeah. Everybody went out and sat in and jammed with other players and went to watch other players play. And it was great for that. Yeah, now, I mean, I was just in Vegas and there's just, there's next to no live music, just, you know, just local kind of stuff in, in bars or clubs that you can go see. I mean, there's a bunch of big shows, but um, yeah. it's hard to find, you know, go to a lounge and hear a good band play. Oh. It's next to impossible. Really, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Back in that, when I was doing that back in the 90s, it was everywhere. Like every every casino had a cabaret or, or, or you know, set up, up above the bar kind of thing yeah. stage and there was always bands yeah it's it's next to nil now wow that's um, crazy and yeah i really miss that i remember back i think it was going in the night used to go down used to be a big fair convention uh in vegas every year yes and uh, i used to go down or the family used to go down and and attend that and i used to go to see uh uh I always see Dick Dameron at the desert now. oh yeah yeah <laughs> right i remember sitting in a couple times uh but yeah, I mean, there was there was always great, and and then the big stars who were playing the really big rooms, the big show, the big always would shows, come and yeah. check out. Yeah, you know, you wasn't. They'd come down uh, to the cabaret after their shows and have a yeah, drink or whatever. It wasn't uncommon and, to see them there at all. Yeah, sit in the cab in the lounge watching the the band. Yeah, uh, we used to play the Golden Nugget downtown in Vegas, for like for with Eddie for like five weeks at a time. Oh yeah, and stay in the hotel and just live there for five weeks at a time. Yeah, you know, multiple times a year. That was like second home at that, that place. Yeah, that was before before they ripped up Fremont Street and turned it into the the walk around kind of thing it is now with the big roof yeah. and everything that was way when I've stopped playing there they were just they were ripping down they were ripping up the street and getting ready to do all that they were they were lowering the the big neon cowboy f from cowboys and uh, from uh, the Binion's horseshoe and the the neon girl from the glitter gulch they were they had to yeah. lower them all like three feet oh yeah to fit on the roof thing and they were just getting into all that stuff and then when I when I played there, and then I was when, and to ask you a question about coming back, I was the thing with Eddie Dunbar had kind of fizzled away. Um, the record had didn't really go anywhere, and um, guys were kind of coming and going. And I think Eddie was kind of it kind of just kind of fizzled apart. So I had I had a month off. I was going to start playing with another casino band. I had a month off, yeah. And I hadn't. I came back home to visit. I hadn't seen my parents or my family or anybody in like three years. So I came back home to visit in between yeah. and I ended up just staying I ended up getting playing George with George Fox and getting sessions at Cedar Tree with Rick and stuff yeah. like that and I just ended up getting all this really cool gigs up here that I didn't need to have a green card to do yeah that was I had come up against a couple of roadblocks in the states because of that I I had a I managed to get a social security number by going into a bank and saying hey I'm going to school I need a bank account Oh, yeah. And they gave me a, a conditional social security number. I wasn't supposed to use it for work, yeah. but I did, and I paid taxes, and it never they, it was all copacetic there. But but it was a couple of roadblocks with the not having a green card thing. Yeah. Um, the NBC, the Hot Country Nights show that was on NBC a few years back then, they had I did all the sessions with, in Hollywood did all the sessions like all the theme music and all the bumper spots coming in and out of commercials and all that yeah. kind of stuff and i was supposed to be in the band and the show in the house band on the show and uh, i had people from nbc calling me going oh what kind of what what shirt size you know what kind of amps do you want what kind of guitars do you want to use and all of a sudden the call stopped and i started okay what's going on here i guess uh <clears throat> when i had done the sessions um for the theme music um, it was me and John Jorgensen and J.D. Manus and John Hobbs and Dennis Belfield and uh, and um, all the great uh, Steve Duncan and uh, fantastic yeah. musicians. I remember sitting in the studio looking around going, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a legal affairs guy from NBC that had come to the studio to talk to me because they knew my situation. I was Canadian. And so they were going to try to pull some legal stuff together and get me some papers so I could do the show. Yeah. And, I guess when it got back to NBC, somebody at NBC with a suit and tie went, oh, I don't have time for this, hire an American. Yeah. And that was the end of that. But needless to say, they did, I watched the show for two years or whatever it was on for, and I listened to myself on the theme music every week. And, <laughs> but um, but it's all good. It was a great experience, and, you know, things like that happened. But, so, yeah, I came back to visit and just ended up staying. I kept 
getting all these great sessions and gigs and stuff. And it wasn't the intention. It just happened. Yeah. So when you came back, where, where did you move to? Where to Kitchener. You... I, I so got in, in uh, a hold of uh, my friend, Ronnie Alexander, who's uh, from Sudbury. Also, we grew up playing together. Yeah. And he had a, who was playing around with a local, with a country band based out of Kitchener. So I ended up in Kitchener working with him when I first came back. And, yeah. And went from there. And it just kind of went from there, snowball from there. Yeah. Yeah, because it didn't, I mean, I think it, it doesn't take long for everyone to know when there's a good player around. Um, it's a small industry. And it's It was like that in L.A. too. It was word yeah. of mouth. You know, I, I was working my butt off there and in no time. And it was good too. And like I said, nobody, there was no bad attitudes about it. Everybody was, was very welcoming. Oh, you're, oh, you're from Canada. Oh, uh, do you know Donnie Reed? <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of that down there because he spent some time in L.A. But yeah, yeah it was, uh, it's all, it's, you know, it's just word of mouth. It doesn't take long. You know? What was the next thing that happened after that? Do you remember what uh, what went in? I remember bringing there? a demo, a CD of some stuff that I played on um, to Rick Hunt at Cedar Tree. Yeah. So he started, he hired me and I started playing on a bunch of stuff back, like all the John Landry stuff and Beverly Mahood stuff and quite a few things back to Amy Warren stuff and for that. And then... Uh, Playing around with Rodney's band, I remember playing a few some gigs in Toronto uh, at the Duke of York, and um, Burke Carroll and Mike Holder came out one night, and I met them, um, and they were talking to me about the you know the Burke was playing with George Fox, and they yeah. were looking to replace the guitar player or whatever, or somebody was leaving or whatever, and so and then I started playing with George, got the gig playing with George Fox, and. And of course, you start doing the festival circuit and everything, and you start meeting. I met everybody really quick. Yeah. That first summer, I started playing with George because George was really active back then in the in mid '90s, about '96 kind of thing. Yeah. '95, '96, and and that was a really good gig at that time because you just met everybody. You know, yeah, they were putting a lot headlining of, big festivals and stuff, and they were putting a lot of money in George. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, yeah, yeah, he was still he with Balmer back at that time. Yeah. Um, I did George. I played with George when he, that well, he you did sound band. for us and Barry at the speedway. Yeah. I, yeah. Did with I, George Fox. And one I of the first, that. yeah, 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 yeah. That the, first summer I played with at him. At the fairgrounds. Were, yeah, yeah. Inside you were doing sound. But I played, I played in this band when, um, he had the all American band when he first started. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, the that first was before stuff. I came back, yeah. I, but I heard about that. Yeah. So Tinty got me that gig. They needed a fiddle player yeah, Tinty and he didn't Moffat, have a yeah. fiddle player in the band. So they were doing a CBC special. I think it was. Yeah. So I did that. And then I did a bunch of dates with him. Um, I don't know what happened with the whole American band. I think that just kind of just fizzled out. It was expensive to have those, they're fine. Probably. Those guys yeah. Up. You yeah, because I mean, I'm thinking time. he was, George was, he opened up for Randy Travis on a tour, I think, at that point, yeah. right? When they, with the, I think. My, yeah, they were the same thing. It was a bunch of stuff, and then um, with that the band. whole American band thing that yeah. kind of uh, fizzled away. Um, but yeah, George is, uh, uh, George is great. He had a, and, and Burke was playing. Yeah. Um, so that was a good band. Mike, and you met Mike Holder, which is, yeah. Mike was doing a lot of work for me in the studio here. Uh, okay. Back in that time period. We well, were, I met you not long after that all yeah. too. I started doing sessions here. And that could have been through, I'm trying to remember how that that happened through, yeah. but that happened maybe through, could have happened through Mike. It um, might have. I wasn't sure who. I don't remember. <laughs> I know. It's, how long ago was that? Yeah, I'm suffering from OLD now. So I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's a cool thing because it's, there's a lot that happens in this neck of the woods, like in, yeah. in Canada. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, it's always been a hotbed for, for musicians and, and recording and, yeah. and, and gigs and, and a lot of things based out of here. I think now it's changing a bit. I think there's a lot of more West coast, uh, players and, 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 you know, cross country, you know, they're the bands are, you know, one guy's from here, one guy's from yeah. the other side of the country. Yeah. Um, then that you know used to be a bit more local, yeah. Um, than yeah. it is now, yeah. Um, but you know, especially in the in the '90s, there was there was a lot of stuff going on, and there's still yeah. lots and lots of um, uh, steady gigs, yeah, uh, happening. 
Yep, not as much anymore. No, it's it's changed, hasn't it? Yeah. It's uh I mean it's still lots going on. Oh yeah, it's still lots going on, but just it's different now. It's that's yeah. all. It is different. Like I say, the the there used to be more week long gigs back then and even yeah. three nighters, Thursday, Friday, Saturday things, which you don't see much of anymore. Now it's more you play Thursday here, Friday there, Saturday there, and you know, do some more driving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We all do a lot of that. Yeah, that happens a lot. <laughs> I want to talk a bit about gear, but you you've been playing that telly now for Oh yeah, that thin line, yeah. I bought that brand new in Reno in ninety three, I think. At Bizarre Guitars. I was in the mood for a telly and I went telly shopping one day and I went yeah. to a bunch of different stores and tried out G and L's and I went to Bizarre Guitars, which is a great big um Fantastic music store in Reno, and they had a wall of two rows of Telecasters. Yeah. And I played probably all of them. I played, you know, really expensive, like $3,000 custom shop ones that just sounded terrible. Yeah. And then other ones that were okay, and I just kind of went down the line, and and there was, a, I saw the one I have now, the the mahogany thin line with the F, F hole in it, and I said, well, give me that one. Let me try that one. I pulled it off the shelf and plugged it in, hit the open A string, and it rang like a Steinway. And that was it. that's what, pack it up. That'll yeah. be the one. That's all I had to do was hit one string open. <laughs> it just rang. Do you remember? Which, than, do you remember what you had to pay for that one? Five hundred and seventy-five bucks. Wow, that's yeah. a, probably the best five hundred seventy-five. Oh bucks god, you'd that spend. thing doesn't owe me anything. I just recently had it refretted finally for the first time. Wow. Yeah, it was a dire need, but it's got a lot of playing on it. That's for sure. Yeah, so I've, I've, it's, I've, I've, it's kind of a Frankenstein guitar now. I've replaced the nut and things like that, and the bridge and the back bridge pickup in it is an original '63 Tele pickup that Dave yeah. Kalmuski found for me years ago. Because the back, the original one that was in there went microphonic on me, so um, he found that one. But otherwise, I put a middle pickup in because I like the having one guitar and having, you know, have the five-way switch and get the strat, the other face strat tones and stuff come in handy. But, uh, yeah, it's pretty beat up now. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I prefer an instrument that looks like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got a lot of character, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. So did you ever, um, once you were back here, did you ever thought that, yeah, maybe I should move back to L.A. or maybe I should go to Nashville or, or uh, did I ever kind of cross your mind I, and... I thought about the Nashville thing here and there I've been there a few times but uh, and then uh, I thought about it for I'd think about it here and there and then uh, go to my gig yeah <laughs> it was just busy so I didn't yeah I don't know I don't know if I would I don't know I wouldn't mind going, being able to go down there and do some playing I know enough guys yeah but I, I'm not I don't have like this screaming desire to pack up and Go do the Nashville thing. You know. There's a uh, hundred thousand guitar players there too. Oh sure. Not that you wouldn't stand out at all. Um, but I wouldn't go do but, that. I'd I'd I would use people that I know and no, try to get, try yeah. to hook up with a session or something and yeah. you know and kind of do that. I wouldn't um, just be you know pounding the pavement and knocking on doors like the other three hundred thousand guitar players that are down there. You know, so. Yeah, and here in you know in in Canada, uh, I mean, there's a lot of you know still a lot of guitar players but there's not a ton of really great guitar players um you know when people are looking for guys to hire uh to play a session you know that the list is pretty short when yeah it comes down to it yeah. there's lots of guys who can do it but there's if you want someone to come in and just solidly nail it yeah um, exactly and that goes for every other musician and essentially drummers bass yeah, players for all of them yeah yeah, there's a there's a select few guys for sure that you'd that you'd call. Yeah, and uh, it's a select few. It's funny. I was well, sessions are a different ball game, you know, as well as I do. It's yeah. uh, it's it's a lot. Of, you can take a, there's a lot of great musicians, you know, but that play well and and but you know you stick them in a studio with a click track and headphones on and <laughs> it's yeah, a, it's a different uh, it's a different thing. It's a whole other art form. You know? Yeah, it is. It's it, it feels like. It's harder for a live guy to go into the studio, but it's easier for a studio guy to go into yeah. a live thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah, because it's, it's that's yeah, because you can go play live and it's live. Yeah, you know, it's it's here and there. It's it's every song is history. By the end on time, you're on to the next one. You know, if you make a mistake, oh well. You know, the guy sitting at the bar 
drinking pints is not really going to give a shit, you know? Yeah, exactly. So eventually you got together and um, with uh, the whole Western Swing thing came about. Oh, with yeah, Shane with WSA, and, yeah. And uh, so that's really kind of taken over um, that's a lot a, of your life. For that's a good while. chunk of uh, what's been going on the last well. It's coming up on 10 years with that band Has in it been April. That long It'll already? Be 10 years in April, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and again, that was just another situation with, uh, well, that was mainly Shane Gousset's idea. But everybody in the band are all players that we knew, and we all worked together. We're all, you know, full-time professional working musicians that just yep. decided to get together and play some Western Swing, you know. Started just for fun at Tuesday, on a, every other Tuesday night out of Mariel at the commercial. And, uh, yeah, it was just something to do, just for fun, just to go, screw it, we're playing Western Swing. And that's how it started. And now it's, you know, 10 years and four albums later. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's morphed into something really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's a great band. Great cast of characters. We're all crotchety and old and jaded and it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. Oh, I man, it makes for some good sounds. Yep. That's for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, it's great because there, there isn't any other Western swing groups I know of around. Um, and it's, it's, it's great music. Yeah, I don't hear much of stuff. I know there's the Bebop Cowboys in Toronto and stuff doing their thing, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know too many other just full on. I think there's a band out of Calgary that Craig used to play with. Yeah, I can't remember, but not. Yeah, I mean, you can count them on one finger. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how many? How many full on like just bands that just do nothing but Western swing? So when you started with that, what was that like playing style wiles? I mean, it, it's different. It's Western Swing's different than kind of yeah, different. Yeah, it's than, the jazz thing. Yeah, I, I'm, which I'm not a great jazz player. I never studied jazz. I, I, I call it bullshit jazz. What I, what yeah. I do with <laughs> Western Swing Authority, but I'm trying to emulate. Um, my biggest uh, inspiration for playing that stuff was Clint Strong, the young fellow that used to play with Merle Haggard for years. Yeah. The jazz guy who played the Les Paul. And he was, he ended up being a, and in fact, he's the guy who started calling me Chappy. Okay. When I lived in Reno, he was living at my friend Mark's house in Reno. Uh, he wasn't playing with Merle at the time. He was playing with Ray Price and with Freddie Powers. Mm -hmm. So he was doing the casino thing too. So we used to go watch Clint play. And, and he's, like I say, he was living at my friend Mark McKinnon's house. And man, we'd go, we'd finish a casino gig and go over to Mark's and Clint would be in the, at like four in the morning, he'd be in the middle of a full-on bebop jam session going on in the living room. And he was just just an absolute monster guitar player to watch, like a bebop jazz guy. Yeah. Like it's frightening to hear him play. I've been recently digging up some stuff. and But uh, so I just try to emulate, because that style of playing works so well over Western Swing, the yeah. bebop stuff. It's like a perfect fit. So I try to just emulate that sort of thing when I'm playing. So, and even to this day, 10 years later, my rule my rule for playing the Western Swing stuff was um, neck pickup on my telly all night and no bending. Oh, yeah. No string bending. That's yeah. my, that was my rule to myself. And it really makes you play different. Yeah. Because country, you know, country playing is there's always string bending and steely kind of bends. And, yeah. And, uh, but when you force yourself to just use the neck pickup only all night, which yeah. is that kind of jazzier tone and no bending it really makes you play different you got to slide into notes instead of bending them up to them yeah and and god forbid i'm not going to try to do any steel guitar licks when i've got ed ringwald on the other side of the stage <laughs> you know? that would just be sacrilege but that's really makes it it really forces you when you put those kind of um i'm not gonna say limits but boundaries around you know you you make those kind of rules to yourself as like i'm only going to do this yeah, you know, it's, and it's it makes smart. you play different. Yeah. It really makes you play different, and that's and I still do that to this day. And when I show up for a gig with them, I, it's it's neck pickup and no bending. Yeah, <laughs> that was my uh, my challenge to myself, and I that's that would have been tough to to overcome. I mean, because you get so used. You've got to that. force I mean, yourself yeah. around where you otherwise would kind of you know on autopilot go for a certain lick. It's like, oh no, no, I gotta, I gotta. I'm a big fan of chromatics of playing like chromatic lines. And yeah. so that's a big help, uh, for moving, moving around. So that, that takes over for the bending. A lot of times you can kind of sneak your way around, around things chromatically instead of bending and, 
it uh, it's fun. It may, that was my that's it keeps it interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. The band sounds great. And yeah, uh, thanks. thanks. Uh, the new album just kind of came out. Yeah, um, a bunch of really it, cool guests on it. Yeah, it sounds yeah, really you, good. Yeah, it's um I've heard a couple cuts from it. Uh, you just gave me a copy, so awesome. Thank you. I can't wait to Yeah. Well I figured to, to find a CD I I player somewhere. Since, <laughs> since all the uh all the pictures were done here on your property yeah. <laughs> at the farm, I figured it, you could at least deserve a copy of the album when it's done. <laughs> no, it's great. I look forward to it. It's gonna I've I've heard lots of great things and, and I've heard a couple cuts online and it sounded really great. Yeah, um, it turned out great. A lot of fun. I wanted to talk a bit about how you approach gigs and how you approach session work um it, there's a lot of different types of gigs and you'll get a lot of different types of calls where it will be someone you've played with a bunch of times before we're going to go out and do a gig here's a couple new tunes um to you're just going to jump into a band that you've never played with and yeah and and you know how how do you approach most of the time when you you head into a gig say you haven't played with somebody before and you you get the call and we need a guitar player are you someone who likes to spend a lot of time and, and sit and prep a lot or are you a guy that kind of goes in and goes for it or what's your what's it's your kind approach? of well a bit of both i mean obviously depending on the gig i mean club work and stuff is no but i don't know it should be the same thing if i'm working with somebody I never worked before i'm gonna i'm gonna write charts i'm gonna write number charts i'm not gonna spend days and hours and hours and hours memorizing a lot of stuff I, I i'm good at reading charts number charts yeah so um and i'll learn you know intros and stuff and whatever like that um the solos i usually just try to do my own thing and fills and stuff because i it's i mean unless it's a particular solo i really like um i'm a lead guitar player so yeah. i'm just i try to do my own my own thing as much as possible and with artist shows same deal you, you got to learn this you got to play the stuff right and i'll chart the stuff out and i'm you know i'm just uh for the most part most most of the artists i've worked with are all really cool about you just kind of letting you do your own thing as far as the solos and the fills kind of go yeah they want the intros and the heads the same and that's you know of course that's you know people used to hearing off the records and stuff but yeah They're but um yeah, I mean, it's just uh, I do a lot of I've, my my truck is filled with work CDs. Yeah, I've always I'm always you know I'll write the charts for this stuff and I'll make a work CD and pop it in while I'm driving around and and that sort of thing. And uh, it's a lot of tunes. I mean, I know sometimes it could be yeah. crazy. Yeah, if you're learning like thirty, forty tunes or something for somebody or for a show, I I don't trust my memory is that great i'd rather have some charts yeah most people are okay i mean you know you see people reading music everywhere it's not yeah it's not you know all the professionals do it you know you've got some music for yeah so i'd rather have the charts and and read the chart and avoid a huge train wreck somewhere and you know that just doesn't work yeah i know it's uh it's something you i know everybody that goes into it I know for myself, depends on the gig. If you've got 30, 40 songs or, you know, something like that, it's like cramming for exam. Yeah. Yeah, wanna, for sure. You want to pile a lot of information in the last few hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like I'll definitely do the, the bulk of the woodshedding, like, you know, coming up on the gig, you know, yeah, I'll work on it ahead of time. But, but then the, uh, a couple of days before it's like, uh, I guess I better listen to this stuff a couple more times just to make sure. <laughs> It's challenging, especially for a guitar player. Um, I mean, it's challenging for every instrumentalist or musician in a band, but the guitar player, you know, has a majority of the leads. There's always a guitar intro. Yeah, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. And, they, and that's those are the ones you know. And you need to remember what those. Yeah. Intros are. I'll I mean, tab that stuff out on my chart once I write a number chart. I'll write a little tab thing at the bottom, and I'll tab out the intro. Yeah. Just to kind of jog my memory in case I, you know, forget or something or whatever, but. Yeah, guitar player, drummer, always the the tough off the top of yeah. the song. Yeah, there, you know, everyone else can kind of lay out for a second. Yeah, <laughs> you think, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I can't hide in the weeds very often. That's for sure. Yeah, because there's always some, and there's always some specific part that's got to happen. I mean, you know, we know with overdubbing, there's always a million. There can often be, you know, the wall of guitars and lots of different guitar tracks going on, but. If I'm if I'm dealing with like a five piece band and I'm the guitar player, you know I've got to I've got to come up with one part that's going to kind of cover 
a bunch of parts. A yeah. bunch of parts, or mm. pick one meaty part of it and do that, or, or that kind of thing. And some, a lot of times it's just intuition too. I just kind of let my my intuition take over and go, okay, this is what you need to do. Yeah. You know, this is what's going to make this song come alive and support the song. And that's what it's about ultimately is it's not about the four or eight bars that I might get a solo on. It's it's what I got to do after that or before that. You know? Yeah. For the rest of the tune, you got to, you got to be a good solid rhythm player. You got to have good time, you know? Yeah. It's not just a drummer. It's got to have good time. Everybody's got to have good time. Yeah. You know, especially like, you know, especially in any, any situation where there's a click track going on, even live, you know, I don't know. Like, there was a point with Susan McGlucark's band where the whole band was on in ears and everybody got the click track. Yeah. And that was beautiful. It was like doing a session live every show. Yeah. And I love that. I love playing the click. It's great. But yeah. you got to have a, yeah, you got to have good time. Yeah. It makes a big difference. Yep. And you, yeah, you do, especially your acoustic playing is your, your timing is really, and you, I can tell you, you're very aware of, of, of timing around you too. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah it's yeah I, that's a bluegrass thing man yeah you grew up playing bluegrass that time is just there there's no you can't be lazy and you know dragging or whatever and even and the other for rushing for that matter too it's just you gotta be you gotta be bang on i love the older i get the more i love playing rhythm oh, yeah. i could sit there and strum those rhythm acoustic tracks i could do that all day i just love it just zeroing in on the on the time and just making that stuff you know yeah just nailing the time i love love it yeah your you your acoustic playing has definitely gone through the roof since i started working with you <laughs> never <laughs> there wasn't never wasn't as if it wasn't good but the last session you did here um it was like holy crap this, you, you mean you're you were just nailing stuff oh, top thanks, to man. bottom right off the top i like, oh, noticed thanks. knows the um you could tell that you you enjoy it and yeah, and yeah I do. Doing it a lot. I like to bury that click, man. It's great. Yeah. Know? Well, on a session too. I mean, time is money in the studio, man. Recording isn't cheap. Yeah. You know, and so you want to. I aspire to do that. You know, like you know, you've got to get in there and you got to get it done and get it. Especially nowadays with hard drive recording, you know, there's clicks and grids and going on all over the place, and and yeah. it's being used for a reason. You know, so you got to be turn up the click. I'm good with that. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, as someone on my position, sometimes as a producer or an engineer, when you've got a bunch of guys in and you got one person that can possibly slow things up, that's a big deal in a session. In Absolutely, the day. somebody's paying for that. Yeah, for that time, and it 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 gives a bad vibe to the whole session because everyone now is like, oh, okay, okay we got to. Oh, wait for I this. know, and I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that weak link where yeah. you know they're. After every pass, I've got to go fix a ton of things, and everybody else is waiting around. And yeah, yeah, it's you no, know, it's not good. I I try, I purposely try to avoid that. You know, it's, yeah, it forces you to kind of really hone that. It does. Spelling. That's the thing about doing sessions, man. You really got to buckle down and produce. Yeah, it's not, uh, especially doing a master session. You know, like it's there's a lot of time and money involved. You know, yeah, it's not, and it's not about. It's not about getting done fast for the sake of getting done fast to go home. It's about getting it done fast and well. Yeah. You know, for that reason, so you're not taking up more time. You know, it's not like I don't give a shit. It's just that it has to be, I want to nail it. I want to nail it right on the money and on the click and, and get it right as soon as possible. So you have more time to do other stuff, you know? Yeah, and I think a long time ago that people used to spend a long time putting an album together. Yeah. Oh, it used yeah. to be like an event. You spend months and, um, you know, you can still spend months now, but it's not, but usually... that was more, that's to me, that was more of what it was like a band situation. When you get a band yeah. that goes into the studio, when it's a band and not necessarily a bunch of session guys. Yeah. So then you take a band, a band would, would hire book a studio for a month and, and do their, and do their, I mean, it might take them a day to get a, a drum track. Yeah. Just for whatever reason. And then it's a band project thing. But um, but when you hire a bunch of session guys, that's a whole different thing. You can waltz, you know, crank out, you know, numerous tunes in a day and great sounding bed tracks, be, you know, with guys yeah. that can do that, could walk in and, and nail it and leave. Yeah. You know, and make it sound like they've been doing it with that, you know, for 20 years with those kind of guys, you know. It's interesting now. I've been paying a bit more attention to newer songs on the radio now and specifically guitar 
parts. Because I was flipping through uh, satellite radio the other day, and I was listening to you know some of the older stuff um, and you know eighties, nineties country, and then listening today. And in the eighties, nineties, there was there were a lot of parts. I mean, there was yeah. intros, and there was really signature guitar licks all throughout the songs and other instruments as well. And and I flip over and then I start listening to what's happening now. And it's still really guitar heavy bass based, but it seems to be it's just rhythm driving. Yeah, a lot of tough guitar parts, just tough rhythm chug tracks and yeah. and, and things like that. Like like just thick, just like um I don't know how to describe it. But yeah, like the wall of guitars thing where it's just it's more for it's yeah, it's, it's less individual notey parts and more of just like um just a heavy drive, you know. It's yeah, more rock. Yeah, uh, more of a feel thing than actual particular notes going on. Yeah, cuz I I forget what I was listening to. I listened to a few songs in a row and I was like god there's like there's no, you know, the piano takes this first guitar fiddle takes this yeah verse. yeah yeah there was like none of that it's just yeah. it's just everyone's just it's just guitars full up yeah bands playing and yeah there's no licks kind of of any sort besides a yeah. solo here and there or yeah an it's kind of, of like sort. The, the guitar stuff now is like it was like 90s rock yeah stuff it's just big guitar parts and, and rhythm tracks and things like that more textural things and actual fills and licks and and things like that yeah yeah and i don't know as a guitar player if that is as fun or as interesting to play i don't know it's it's, it's what different. you got to do you got to keep up with the times i mean yeah. you know but it, but it's different i mean I, but mm-hmm. like i'm not playing nearly as much chicken picking stuff on people's records now as i did back in the 90s yeah it's just a different that's just the way the music is it'll it'll always it works itself around it always does it seems like every 10 years there's a a new, new batch sound, of people yeah. grumping and complaining about the way country music's going, yeah. but that's what it is. But uh, yeah, it's it's a different thing, different tones, and and um, but again, it's back to that timing thing. Like they're, they're more rhythm oriented parts yeah. now. So when you're doubling and stuff like that, and making you know the big wall of guitars, that's that's an integral part of that too. It may be not as many licks, but it's still. It's time focused, you know. Yeah. It's time driven, and those big tough rhythm tracks have to be on. So it's it's different, but I still, I, I don't complain about it. I like to do it. It's still what you got to do, and you yeah. got to do it well, regardless of what it is. It still has to be done well. Yeah, and it, it's it parts too where you have to get that big wall, but you you just can't every single time you do it, you can't have the same tone. You can't have the same. You know, you got to build yeah. build that. Yeah, sound and it's just not. Yeah, a grab another plan. guitar for the double and stuff like that, and yeah. and just change it up. Yeah, Chappie, in the future, where do you kind of do you look far ahead and see where you want to be, or you just kind of take things as a go? Do you have a a game plan for the next ten, fifteen, twenty years? Um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to. Yeah, because this business is just so. You know, you never know what's going to happen from one month to the next. Sometimes, you know, my yeah. calendar's filling up and. That's always the main concern is to keep working. You know, yeah. I ain't going to retire anytime soon. That's for sure. Yeah. You seem like a guy that I can't see retiring. You know, like it seems, yeah, no, not no. that any musician really retires, but you, no. I see that you're a guy that would just keep playing as, you know, as long as you possibly Yeah. Well, I mean, can. that's what I do. Yeah. I don't do it. I don't fix trucks and stuff like that. And I don't fly planes and stuff, you know, so that's, this is what I do. So I just try to keep at it and, it's funny how there's always a little, I'm trying to get, I've been working with a couple of people, um, some different people, Dan Badger uh, locally and um, a friend of mine in, in Oshawa named Mark Konorowski with a project he's doing called East Haven. And um, it looks like I might be doing some work with um, small town girls, the sisters from down to Tilsonburg, but I want to get into doing some more producing. Yeah. That's definitely something I've been kind of dabbling on that. And I want to do more of that. I want to get on the other side of the glass and and do some more of that. That's something I'm. That's something I'm kind of working on. Kind yeah. of yeah, you doing should do that. that for sort of, sure. Yeah, that's something I want to do. Made an, I've played on enough records. I know how they work, and I want to. Yeah. I want to do some more producing, but. But yeah, that I'd definitely like to get into doing more of that. But yeah, the plan. I mean, like I say, there's always 
seems to be something new comes up and another project or and somebody you haven't worked with before, all of a sudden you've got 12 gigs with. And yeah, I enjoy doing what I do in freelancing and play with a million different people. That's, I love doing that. I've, it's always been my thing is, is, is to show up with a band I've never played with before and make it sound like I've been there for 20 years. Yeah. That's fun to me. Yeah. And it gets easier. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time now. It, like 40 years since I started playing guitar. And so it just, it's fun for that. I enjoy the, the just being able to walk up there and let my, let my intuition and experience take over and tell me what I have to do. You know, I trust that now. Yeah. And you can see, you know, the shows I've seen you work in the last little while here at our theater and stuff. You, you come in, you certainly, I wouldn't say you're in charge, but musically, you are you kind of you always feel like you you lead everything that's going on right um, yeah if I, yeah, not that just, you're trying to no but, yeah but you have that you just it's have just that work confidence ethic. it's and a work ethic that, yeah, yeah that's what it is i don't want to mm-hmm. you know i'm there i'm gonna mean it yeah you know i'm not there to piss around this is my job this is what i do yeah no it's great and these are good shows and it's you got to put some time in, get do the homework and 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 command it you know you gotta that's what i've always enjoyed when i've watched other people over the years is guys who just command what they're doing they're just they're not piddling around they're up there and they mean it and yeah they mean every note and they, they you can just see the confidence and the, the experience and yeah it shows i've okay. always enjoyed that out of people i've that i've you know um admired over the years and yeah that kind of thing not just the notes it's the command of them and and what guys are you know yeah. Anybody can play a G chord, but some guys play a G chord and you go, holy shit, that's one hell of a G chord. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, taking some time and oh, dropping by. And uh, it's always a pleasure having you here at the studio and uh, at any gig. And, <laughs> thanks, uh, man. Appreciate it. Thanks. And love having you here and, and good luck this year. I hope yeah, to see you a lot. Thanks. So I'm going to well, see you in we'll the summer see, for sure. Yeah, we'll be here for a couple weeks in the summer. And- yeah. It's going to be fun. Right on. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Darren. Yeah.